Welcome, and thank you for joining our fifth and final panel discussion looking at U.S. electoral issues through the lens of the 2005 Carter Baker Commission on Federal Election Reform. I'm John Williams, a fellow of the Presidential Elections Program at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. The Institute has organized this five-part series with the Carter Center. The Carter Center and the Baker Institute are nonpartisan organizations founded by former President Jimmy Carter and former Secretary of State James A. Baker. 16 years ago, President Carter and Secretary Baker came together to co-chair a bipartisan commission that made a series of recommendations about ways to build confidence in U.S. elections. Today, debate about electoral reform continues to rage. Americans are deeply divided and politicians often seem more interested in exploiting those divides rather than in searching for common ground. In this context, we thought it important to bring together smart, reasonable people to concert constructive con discussions about how we might be able to strengthen our electoral processes and in doing so, ultimately strengthen our democracy. The title of today's discussion is Opportunities and Challenges of Election Reform. Our panelists are Michael Adams, Kentucky's Secretary of State, Jocelyn Kiley, Associate Director of the Pew Research Center. Charles Stewart III, the Keenum Suheen Distinguished Professor of Political Science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And Alejandro Tulio, Director of Legal Sciences at San Martin National University in Argentina. Once again, our moderator today is Doug Chapin, Director of Election Research at the Forrest Group, Mar Forrest Marsh Group. Doug also served as Director of Research in 2005 for the Carter Baker Commission. After today's discussion, David Carroll of the Carter Center will offer a few closing remarks. But first, we're starting with this very short video. Thank you. In 2005, the United States was in its fifth year of efforts to reform its election system. The hotly contested and controversial 2000 presidential election had identified flaws in the nation's registration and voting laws that were seen to contribute to a lack of confidence in election outcomes. A 2002 bill called the Help America Vote Act, or HAVA, addressed some of those issues but failed to settle all of the arguments that had arisen around election reform. For example, State laws requiring voters to provide photo identification were generating backlash amid claims of disenfranchisement. Worry about new voting technology was leading to fears of counting errors. And growing numbers of absentee and mail ballots were raising concerns about the possibility of fraud. In response, former President Jimmy Carter and former Secretary of State James Baker III agreed to co-chair a bipartisan commission housed at Washington, D.C.'s American University to examine these and other outstanding election reform issues. The final report, entitled Building Confidence in U.S. Elections, stressed the important role of elections to the nation's democracy and made a series of recommendations, some controversial at the time, that sought to protect access to polls and the integrity of the election process. Today, many of the challenges that the Commission recognized have been addressed and are now familiar aspects of the American voting experience yet they remain central to current election reform debates. In this panel series, we are revisiting key issues in the Carter-Baker Report and assessing how they can help foster constructive dialogue on election reforms. During today's webinar, titled Opportunities and Challenges for Election Reform, we will discuss nonpartisan election administration. On this issue, the 2005 Commission Report said, to minimize the chance of election meltdown and to build public trust in the electoral process, nonpartisan structures of election administration are very important, and election administrators should be neutral, professional, and impartial. The Commission pointed to international experience in this area, noting that the trend in the world is toward independent election commissions composed of nonpartisan officials who serve independently of political parties or the executive or legislative branches. In the 16 years since the Commission issued its recommendations, the issue of nonpartisan election administration has continued to stay in focus. In today's discussion, we'll look more closely at this issue with a special focus on public opinion and how it affects efforts to promote nonpartisanship in a highly charged political landscape, keeping in mind the ultimate goal of building confidence in U.S. elections.
afternoon, everyone. And welcome or welcome back uh, to our uh, panel discussion um, of the Carter Center and the Baker Institute. Uh, again, my name is Doug Chapin uh, with the Forest Marsh Group in Northern Virginia. Uh, and I'm delighted to be, at least by association with a group of smart uh, and reasonable people today, um, drawn from um, some of the leading thinkers in the field um, and today an international field of experts on the topic of nonpartisan election administration. Um, have really enjoyed the panels so far. Um, the goal of this series, as was the goal of the Carter Baker Commission, was to promote um, reasoned and bipartisan dialogue about important election issues. Uh, and we've been delighted with um, the response so far and, and I'm really looking forward to today's uh, conversation. Um, quick tour through um, our logistics today. Uh, I'm going to start with an opening question to each one of our panelists um, to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves and um, get the conversation started. Um, we'll then move to a moderated discussion where I'll throw questions out to the entire panel uh, and allow them to um, chew on them as they like. Uh, and then in the last, say, 15 minutes or so of the event, um, we'll turn to questions from the audience, which you can submit through the Q&A button there at the bottom of your Zoom webinar screen. Um, we'll be collecting those to make sure that we cover as many of them as possible um, before we sign off um, close to 2.15 Eastern today. So again, welcome or welcome back. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm gonna start with Secretary Adams. Um, Secretary, uh, the Commonwealth of Kentucky recently enacted a bipartisan reform bill to make changes to its voting laws. How did you manage this partisan environment and what advice do you have for our state seeking to accomplish the same thing? Uh, well, thank you so much uh, for including me today and thank you for that question. I'm very proud of Kentucky. Uh, I think uniquely uh, this year, as far as I know, we're the only state that's pulled this off. It's actually made it easier to vote and harder to cheat on a bipartisan uh, basis while other states are cut up uh, in partisan warfare. I'm really proud of that. I think the special sauce that we found here uh, is that we've learned that you can have access and security at the same time. That's certainly one of the premises of the Carter Baker Commission report. Uh, and something I believe here, and we've seen uh, actually work here. Uh, last year on a bipartisan basis, our legislature gave our Democratic governor and me, a Republican chief election official, joint emergency powers to make changes to the election system, to be able to safely accommodate voting during a pandemic. We implemented expanded, ex, uh, expanded absentee voting uh, and in-person early voting. We had neither of those in Kentucky uh, previously. And both of those were popular with Republicans and Democrats and our turnout really shot up. Uh, so uh, we've learned that you can have access and security simultaneously. Uh, but here's the real interesting thing. Actually, they reinforce each other. Let me give you two examples. With the early voting, uh, a plurality of our voters last year voted early. Uh, in person and early. And what we found is not only did it make it easier to vote by having multiple days to vote instead of just one as we'd always had, we actually made the election more secure that way. I've got a bipartisan ballot integrity task force and they reported back to me that the early voting helped uh, reduce the number of irregularities that we typically had. We have vote fraud in Kentucky. It's not a myth. Uh, it's not widespread certainly, but we do have occasional cases of vote buying out in the mountains uh, where there's high poverty. It's harder to run a vote buying operation over multiple days. And it's easier for law enforcement to monitor an election for irregularities when it's happening in a smooth up period of time of several days instead of just one day of frenetic chaos. So the early voting certainly improved access to the ballot, but it also enhanced security at the same time. Similarly with our absentee voting, for the first time we created a portal for voters to be able to bypass the paperwork, go online and directly request an absentee ballot. That made the ballot certainly more accessible to voters, but it also enhanced our security. For the first time, those ballots could now be monitored electronically. Every voter could go online and see where that ballot was in the process. Had it been sent out, had it been received back and cast and counted? So we had accountability there for the voter, but we also had the ability of me to surveil the election in real time and monitor for any lost or stolen ballots. And so these are just two great examples of how on an administrative basis last year and now in this legislation on a permanent basis, uh, we've made it both easy to vote and hard to cheat at the same time. Wonderful. Well, thank you. And thanks again for being here. Looking forward to having you with us. 
um, today. Uh, let me turn next to um, Jocelyn Kiley um, from the Pew Research Center. Um, Jocelyn, uh, what does Pew's public opinion research say about Americans' attitudes toward voting policies and election administration? And specifically, is there a desire um, for nonpartisan election administration? Sure. Um, so we've we've tracked attitudes about uh, aspects of uh, the election process and and voting for for some time. And I think um, the story is that there are some areas of bipartisan in the public agreement about election policies. Um, in fact, some of the very things that the secretary just just noted, we find in our research. So, for instance, there's bipartisan support for expanded early voting, uh, though Democrats, of course, are more likely to support this than, than Republicans. You find a, a majority of Republicans saying this as well. Um, similarly, uh, you find that um, there's some support for automatic registration and some of the other um, proposals um, from the Carter uh, the, the Carter Baker uh, uh, initiative and so um, and so public opinion does find some areas of bipartisan agreement in, in the public. Uh, I would say though we also find a, a fair amount of partisan disagreement and I think that's the crux of a lot of, of the debates that we're seeing in the public and among uh, political elites over the course of the last couple of years. Um, and so uh, there really isn't a, a clean story, though there are these opportunities um, for um, bipartisan efforts. One thing I also will point to is that we've seen a, a real shift in, in opinion on some of these dimensions. So for instance, uh, absentee voting, really as recently as a couple of years ago, we saw about half of Republicans supporting this, uh, as well as the majority of, of Democrats supporting expanded access to absentee voting, but we really did see a decline in the share of Republicans supporting expanded absentee access um, over the, the course of the last election. So there's that dynamic that's at play. With respect to the question about nonpartisan uh, administration, that's actually a tough thing to ask about um, in public opinion because there's broad support um, for bipartisan efforts, nonpartisan efforts, people like these things in the abstract. Um, you ask, you know, people if they want their politicians to collaborate and cooperate, and you find broad support for that. But when you get into the nitty gritty, you you often find that um, that people also like for for the people that they support to be in power, and that that is not um, particularly true to this area of uh, of policy debate, um, but it certainly applies to uh, debates around voting, voting access and voting administration, just as it does to any number of policy areas as well. So you, you might say that, that the nonpartisan election administration is like that famous observation that you should always compromise on principle, but fight to the death on details. That's right. We have tons of tons of research along this line, even even around the issue of compromise and what compromise means. We often say compromise compromise means to many people that I get eighty percent of what I want and you get twenty percent of what you want. So um, so that can be be tough when it actually comes to bipartisan compromise. Wonderful. Well, thank you uh, and and welcome. Um, let me turn next to um, my friend and colleague, Charles Stewart um, from MIT. Charles, um, I know that for several cycles now, you and the team at MIT have conducted um, the survey of the performance of American elections. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, what the survey is and especially what it has said over time about Americans' attitudes toward partisanship in election administration? You would think that after 15 months of doing this nonstop, I would I would not be that guy who doesn't unmute. I apologize. Um, <laughs> thanks, thanks, Doug, and thanks to the Carter Center and the Baker um, Baker Institute for sponsoring this important conversation. Um, and the question is about um, what the survey, the performance of American elections (SPAE), um, tells us about um, voters' experience and what they expect about nonpartisan um, election administration. Um, so. For those who don't know, the SPAE is a survey that I've been putting into the field with my team since the presidential election of 2008. We um, interview at least 200 people in every state um, in the country uh, starting the day after election day. 
Um, this year, we were able to expand the, um, the, the um, sample. So we talked to over 18,000 voters immediately after Election Day to ask them about what their experience, what their experience was. And we asked soup to nuts, um, things like, is it, how hard was it to find your polling place? How, hard, how good were the polling officials? How easy was it to vote on the machine? Um, you know, how easy was it for you to get your absentee ballot, et cetera? We also asked some policy um, questions very similar to what um, Pew asks about, um, questions about um, confidence and those sorts of things. And so what do we find and how does it relate to nonpartisan um, 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 election um, administration? The first thing I would say is actually not to answer the question directly, but to start from this question about voter confidence. So I like to I like to um, 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 quip when people ask me, well, what causes voter confidence? I always like to say, well, we know from the research on which I've conducted that you can make voters confident by uh, providing two things: you make sure that their voting experience was a good one, and you make sure that their candidate always wins. Um, and if you get those two things, they'll be confident, right? So election administration, you know, is not about making sure particular people win, but it is about making the experience a good one. And so that's the area in which I think there's a lot of room for um, nonpartisan, and I would even say, being at MIT, scientific approaches to election administration. Um, so the SPAE tells us that even in tough years, that most people, when they go to the polls, it's easy to find the polling place, they have a good experience, the poll workers do their job, the equipment is good, and all the rest. Their line is short, et cetera. But there are some people who wait in long lines, who have lousy election workers. Small number, about 5%. But those are the voters who are um, dissatisfied. And that's where you know, stories emerge that can um, brew discontent locally with the quality of the elections. So then I, so um, as Jocelyn says, when you ask people what, what they like about election administration, they want it to be nonpartisan. But we also know that they want their experience to be a good one. And so how do you make sure their experience is a good one? And there I'll just pivot and, and, and close my remarks by noting that there have also been, in addition, in addition to kind of public opinion work in the scientific realm, there's been real engineering, scientific, management-related work in polling places to basically apply what we know in management science to the running of polling places, apply what we know about design techniques to the design of ballots. And those sciences, those arts and crafts, shorten lines, make um, ballots more easy to follow, make instructions easier to follow, voters make fewer mistakes, and at the end of the day, they're more confident. And we as voters are more confident that the results are based on the will of the people and not based on you know, the whim of a machine that broke down or something like that. So it's a long way of saying, we hear from, that we, we hear from, the, 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 um, um, from the polls that people like good election administration. And there will be sometimes disagreement about what that means, but it is important to note that a lot of time there's not disagreement. And if we can give election officials the space and the um, and the, you know, equip them to apply best principles, um, that's a really good thing. Thank you very much. I'm always reminded of the, to paraphrase that old economics text, and what we need to focus on is elections as if people mattered. Um, and if we give them good experience, um, they will have good things to think about the process. Um, great. Well, thank you for being here. Um, and last but absolutely not least, um, let me turn to um, Alejandro Tulio. Um, uh, as someone who's worked in elections around the world, um, what lessons does the international experience have for American efforts uh, to achieve nonpartisanship in election administration? Thank you. I'm pleased to be here and try to give my views and 20 years of involvement in election management. Building confidence in elections needs confidence in every process of the organization of the elections. And that relies on the professionality and the confidence in the electoral administration and the electoral managers. I believe that in the next, last 30 years, in Latin America, we have evolved from dictatorships to 
more or less fully democratic countries, in part of by the um, ruling of clear processes of selection of uh, our government governments. Elections are fair. Elections are usually well conducted, and that relies on uh, a common ground of laws that are very clear, a common law, a uniform law in all the country, in every country of the region, and uh, electoral management bodies that are fully uh, engaged with the, and, and commit with the democratic process. I believe that in, the, in a lesson as in the states, uh, the, in the United States, elections are managed in, at state level, we must uh, try to um, go towards uh, non-partisanship in the electoral management bodies by means of state laws that create electoral board, boards, electoral management boards. That boards must divide in the law, there must be a division between the nomination process from the appointment process. The nomination process must be on the hands of universities, in the case of lawyers, maybe the bar, or uh, grassroots NGOs commit with democratic processes or with public affairs. And that nomination must be uh, a very open process. Then the legislature must be the appointed uh, authority. A bipartisan committee in the legislature must select and assess the legislature in order to appoint people that are fully independent, with no ties with the government, with the administration, and no ties with political parties. We must prevent conflict of interests from the political parties, from the administration, for the, or, or from any uh, subject that may impact on the electoral process. I believe that um, pro, uh, the confidence of the people is um, proportionate to the publicity of this process, a public appointment process, a uh, uh, open nomination activity may contribute to non-partisanship in not only in the uh, nomination or the appointment, but also in the work of the committee, in the work of the board. It's very important that the board delivers its work in a non-partisan way. And that is what uh, contributes to rebuild confidence, lost confidence in electoral processes. Thank you very much um, and welcome. I'm looking forward to having you with us today. Um, let me start our discussion um, with something that Secretary Adams um, brought up at the outset. Um, this notion um, deeply ingrained in the entire Carter-Baker process and the final report that the concepts of access and integrity are not only not in conflict, but actually can benefit one another. Um, just to the panel generally, um, how might developments in expanding nonpartisan election administration actually help further both of those goals? And this is free play. I won't call on anyone, but I'll Feel free to get us started if anybody's got a thought. Well, I'll, uh, I'll chime in real fast. Let me give you just one more example and then I'll, I'll wrap it up into your uh, last question. So we added a cure process in Kentucky uh, last year, administratively uh, first and now through legislation, a cure process such that if a voter uh, mails in an absentee ballot, uh, we do verify signatures uh, against the voter registration card of that voter. Uh, the last major election before I at the office, the state threw out seven and a half percent of those ballots and never notified the voters. That's, that's scandalous <laughs> to throw out that proportion of votes and not inform the voters. With the cure process, we actually now contact those voters if there's a mismatch of their voter registration card and their absentee ballot envelope. But this, this benefits access and security. It potentially re-enfranchises people who through no fault of their own have seen their signature change over time, but also gives me a lead on potential vote fraud if there's been a case where the voter says that wasn't me, there was impersonation. Uh, but I, I think there's a real political angle of this too. You've gotta to be able to sell access to Republicans and sell security to Democrats. 
And so the way I've done it in Kentucky, at least, is is by explaining that we can give you what you want without you actually sacrificing anything. No one uh, in our legislature, when they were debating this bill, had to feel that they gave up anything. They didn't have to give up any security to get access, and they didn't have to give up any access to get security. So I think the real key here is number one, start with a bipartisan process. Uh, we made a point to get everybody around the table, uh, the, the governor, uh, county clerks of both parties, legislators of both parties, uh, me, and, and sit down and, and hash it out and make sure everyone's interests and concerns were addressed. So from the outset, it was a bipartisan process. That led to a better product. There's, there's no question about it. But it also led to a better look. And I think this is a really important point, too. Uh, it's, it, it doesn't have to be, in my view, uh, apolitical or nonpartisan to be fair and, and respected by the public universally, but at least it has to be bipartisan. If we can't get that far, at least it needs to be bipartisan. I think the most important thing we did last year was people saw the governor and me together at press conferences agreeing on the changes. And so the Republicans felt like, well, it must be legit. Adams is, is signing off and the Democrats thought it's legit. The governor's signing off. That's a really important thing here. Even if the substance doesn't change at all, the look has to be right. And that's the biggest problem with what's going on today in Texas, what's going on in uh, Georgia, Florida, and some other states is there's a bad look, even if the bills are perfectly fine. And some, some I think are fine and some are not, but even if the bills are all perfectly fine, the look is terrible. It looks like one party is trying to take over the system. And I would suggest it's the same problem in Washington with HR1 and S1. It looks like the Democrats are trying to take over the system. You just cannot have partisan election legislation and, and laws. It's got to be bipartisan from the very outset. And it's got to be communicated by uh, representatives of both sides to the public saying this is a good deal for everybody. If, if I could if I could jump in um, and add to pile on on what the secretary was was talking about I mean there's a, a couple of other reforms that are uh, out and about and that um, I think I mean, at the core of them are about the simultaneous achievement of security and access one is automatic voter registration um, which um, is a you know the way of basically having the state register people when they interact with government, most notably through um, um, driver's license facilities, but also sometimes through social service agencies, et cetera. Um, and one of the reasons why that's um, it's kind of obviously an access issue, but it's also a security issue, um, because it turns out that you know the driver's license department is very interested in a bunch of things, including, for instance, citizenship, for real ID, the same with social service agencies. You know, they can only give benefits to people who are citizens in most states. And so, and then finally, um, and that interaction usually, I mean, the 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 um, the voter, potential voter, um, along with a caseworker or a clerk, is very intent on getting all the information down right. And so, by streamlining that process, you have fewer mistakes on the one hand. And on the other hand, you get more people into the system. Okay, that's one example. Another example is um, an organization called ERIC, the um, Electronic Registration Information Center, um, which is a consortium of states um, who join to share their um, voter registration information and related information, for instance, driver's license records, so that states themselves can sort out who's moving around, who needs to be removed from this role, um, potentially removed from this role because they moved over here. But part of that system is not only the maintenance of, of, of the voter rolls, um, the trimming of dead wood, making sure people aren't, aren't double, double registered, but also has a provision in which the, it's also possible to reach out to people um, that you discover who are eligible but not registered. Um, and so there's at that aspect of it too. So you know, there's, there's all sorts of things like that out there in the world. Um, sometimes are grand bargains, um, as it happened in, in, in Kentucky, it's happened in other places. Um, sometimes it's embedded within a particular um, reform, and it's actually really quite surprising the number of, of those reforms that are like that. I agree with Secretary Adams that electoral law must be the, a common heritage, so must be bipartisan. That, that uh, is the, the proper path towards integrity in elections and fair elections. And if you believe that integrity is that everyone who is entitled to vote can vote, 
and anyone who is not entitled to vote may vote. In the first case, an opportunity. In the second case, a prohibition and an impossibility. Fair elections must be three out of three, secure, competitive, and accessible. There would not be competitive if they aren't accessible and if they aren't secure. There wouldn't be secure if anyone who wants to, to vote can't has a, an obstacle, an improper and illegitimate obstacle. And accessibility is a sign of the times also. In a polarized country, accessibility is one of the healing procedures towards avoiding polarization. I'll step back, step in and talk a little bit also. I think it's important. Some of these themes are themselves um, up for debate in this polarized country. So even this core question about whether uh, elections can, that you can make it easier to vote, make more access um, and not trade off security. We, we ask a question that asks people whether in fact that's a tra there's a trade off there or not. And yet the majority of Americans say there isn't, but there's a lot, there's a big partisan divide on that, um, where where Democrats overwhelmingly say there's not a, a trade-off, uh, whereas Republicans are more split, more likely to say that that making access making access uh, easier is necessarily a trade-off for security. So I think you know to the extent that one of the the points is to talk about finding things to communicate about in a bipartisan way. One question is messaging around that this this tenet that if if the belief from both Democrats and Republicans is that you can have um, secure elections and broader access, then there is a there's a messaging and a bipartisan effort that needs to happen around that because in, at least in the public you don't you you do not see um, partisan agreement bipartisan agreement on on that question. Um, so I think that's that's an important thing to think about. And then I also think um, I think you see it in a lot of these other examples. Um, I think Charles touched on, on a number of, of areas that maybe, you know, outside of the bright lights of politics, you can probably find a lot of bipartisan agreement, uh, Republicans and Democrats finding uh, areas of election administration that, um, that they can agree would be good reforms. Um, and yet uh, in the scrutiny of the public, um, you find a lot of polarization around, around these issues. And so the question, you know, I, I guess this is really outside of what I do at the Pew Research Center. The question is, is there a way to remove these debates from the, you know, spotlight of politics and, and have what in the past might have been considered backroom discussions um, in, in order to have some of these grand bargains uh, because they are so, it, it, these discussions are so hyperpolarized. That actually segues into uh, my next question. I think that's um, given that we do see that split, um, what do um, folks on the panel think um, is necessary to find a way through the current intense partisan battles uh, over these issues? You know, how do we get to um, the kinds of grand bargain that we've seen in Kentucky um, or consensus that we hope to see? other states. Um, we know where we want to be. We know where we are. Um, we just need to figure out how to get from here to there. Any thoughts? I'll throw out uh, one more. One of my favorite little technical uh, statistical points that I used to try to get my bill passed uh, was I noted that uh, in 2020 with the, uh, with the expanded voting options that we offered, the proportion of vote cast by Republicans was about the same and by Democrats was about the same as it was in 2019, the year before when I was on the ballot. In 2020, we had our highest turnout ever. We only had 42% turnout in 2019, but the results came out the same. The same counties voted the same way by the same margins, even though the turnout was up about one and a half times. And so what I've tried to convey to legislators and, and others as well, but especially legislators is, Adopting these procedures doesn't help Democrats. It doesn't hurt Democrats or, or Republicans. It just helps the voters. The, the games are going to be played and the games are going to come out the same way, one way or the other. But this is good for the voters. And uh, 
the voters, of course, told their legislators they liked these things that we did. They told local officials. Local officials also lobbied for them. Uh, but I, I think at the outset, if you can try to prove this, uh, then give it a shot, that the results aren't going to be changed. Nobody wants to go vote for a, a bill to help the other side win, right? Uh, you can persuade legislators to do things that aren't necessarily in their interest, but you can't persuade them to do things that are not in their interest. They're, they're rational and they're political. If you can at least show them with the data that the games are going to be played, they come out the same way, even if you expand voting or, or flip it to the security stuff, whether it's voter ID or cleaning up the voter rolls or whatever it is, if you can persuade on that side, Democrats, that they're going to be treated fairly. They're not going to lose votes or lose elections because of what you're doing. They'll accept it. So the real key is, can you find things that make things better for the voters and don't harm the political interests of, of either side? That's a win-win. And those things are very, very doable. And so um, if, I could, if I could jump jump in there, I think, you know, I, I to some degree, and, and, and it bears directly on this point, um, that to some degree, I think we are victims of the rhetoric about the promises and the fears about um, policy change or reform in the elections arena. Um, and that is to say reformers, I think, over claim um, the salutary effects, especially on turnout, um, that, ref that, that comes with reform. Um, and that opponents of reform are, in, in a sense, kind of believe that <laughs> or, you know, kind of take their cues from the folks who are pushing the reform and believe that, ah, there must be a big partisan advantage to that reform. And I think we in political science and in this um, larger field of election science have done a horrible job in communicating the facts, the evidence, such as um, Secretary Adams is pointing out, is that at the most, for any of these reforms, you maybe sometimes will see a point shift here, point shift there, but that the, the cacophony of the campaigns swamps all of that in almost every case. If you want a reform that really had a huge effect, look at the Voting Rights Act. And that took 20 years to have really significant changes in terms of the um, um, of composition of the electorate. Anything else is going to be in the noise of all of politics. And I think that academics like myself have to just do a better job of communicating what we know about kind of the turnout effects, the effect on the, the composition of the electorate as a, as a consequence of reforms, and to try to turn the conversation back to this issue of the experience for the voters. Justin or Alejandro, I want to give you a chance to jump in if you'd like. If not, I can keep Just up. a comment. It is not a problem of the United States. It's a problem of human nature. In, in, in discussing electoral laws, it's discussing the nature of power and the construction, the engineering of the construction of power. So it's reasonable that no one can uh, give the other advantage. So it's very important that knowledge prevails over the myth. There are many myths around elections. There are many, many um, uh, urban legends around election administration and how can you uh, put out some votes and how can you manage knowledge, uh, clear laws, proce standardized procedures, quality management. Electoral administration is usually disregarded or at least underrated in the academy and in politics, but voter registration, the design of ballots, technology issues, all of that is in the core of election administration. We must put a light on this. We must focus uh, a voter-centered approach to electoral reform is an approach that puts electoral administration, election administration in the center of the, the, the ring and everyone can see what, what is happening. The turnout is very important and, and you must try to uh, push people to participate. That's early voting, remote voting, but you must put aside 
uh, the all the myth around that uh, these benefit Democrats, these benefit uh, Republicans. In every country, it happens the same. In Latin America, when we came from highly polarized and violent societies, we try to reach consensus by by a strong bipartisanship, bipartisanship in uh, the, the negotiation in back channels, with back channels of electoral, of electoral law. But the negotiation must be um, uh, discreet, but the outcome must be very public and, and explained, not only by the authors, by the people involved in electoral dispute, but by the academy. There is a very, very important role of the political science and law professors, law teachers, to make civic education around the more problematic issues of electoral administration. Thank you, Alejandro. I'm gonna, I just want to turn to something that you talked about a little bit um, earlier. So the, the, the Carter Baker Center, um, or the Carter Baker Report uh, endorsed um, a concept of um, independent election administrators drawn largely from international experience that operate um, outside of political party influence um, and um, formally outside of the executive or the legislature. Um, wanted to ask the panel generally, given the current nature of American election administration, which is not only decentralized, but very closely tied to state and local government, is there a path from here to there, um, assuming that is a desirable outcome, um, how might we make the, the, the case to um, states and localities and the national government that such a structure is desirable and even possible? That's what our parents used to call the $64,000 question. But I'll just toss that out there. How do, and can we get to something that looks more like an independent election administration sphere um, from the current scheme here in the United States? Well, well maybe I'll jump in. I'll, I'll leave the nitty gritty to the others on, on the panel, but but I'm I'm struck by, I think one thing that's, that is a factor here uh, is how, how independent people will be perceived and whether even the perception of independence is possible. Um, and and I say that I think you can come at that from a number of different ways, but you know we are also in an era of you know deep distrust in in, in institutions and government and in you know among some segments of the of the public among elites, right? And an independent commission uh, would necessarily be a commission of experts and um, and and. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the practical politics to others and, and the nitty gritty of how this might work, but I do think um, selling that independence is maybe not terribly easy <laughs> to certain segments of, of the public. And even though, as I said, you know, in, in broad strokes, I do think, you know, Americans will express uh, support for a nonpartisan uh, election administration. We, we haven't asked that specifically, but, you know, a similar related topic area is obviously around uh, redistricting. And we've asked a question around redistricting uh, recently, and we find much more people support uh, the notion of nonpartisan redistricting uh, commissions. And I think that that would largely, that opinion about uh, election administrations would largely parallel that. So, uh, but I guess I, I do think there, there would be a little bit of concern of sort of independent in name only, right? That, that really that any commission might be captured by one or another partisan uh, group. And so, so that, those are some of my thoughts. Uh, a, a couple of, I mean, a couple of thoughts. One is just the, you know, the cautionary tale of Wisconsin. Um, which I think um, most people in this business would agree had the closest thing we were likely to get in this country to such an independent election authority, um, an elections board that was appointed on a nonpartisan basis, retired judges, and um, it got caught up in a partisan kerfuffle and it's not independent anymore. And so, um, so that's, that's one thought, you know, there is this cautionary tale and I think it's consistent with what Jocelyn was saying. 
On the other hand, I, this last election got me thinking that we might have more independent election administration than we think, but we have to think about the system more broadly than the election authority. And here I'm thinking about what I call the fact-based institutions who are responsible for communicating about and deciding the outcome of the 2020 election. Um, when they were called on to make decisions, they made decisions based on facts. <laughs> Oftentimes those were the electoral, actually the election, the election boards, many of whom were elected and operated on a partisan basis. But nonetheless, the basis of rule of law in the United States hems in what even partisan election boards themselves can do. And, you know, attempts to run around those, you know, fact-based institutions in the election boards gave rise to court cases. And what, roughly 50 judges of all sorts had a simple question. What are your facts? If you don't have any facts, get out of here. And so at the end of the day, you know, that fact-based system prevailed. Um, it was based on the rule of law, but it wasn't entirely the election authority. Um, and so, um, you know, so as we answer this question, I think we have to ask about the layer of institutions we have in this country and their ability to, to decide elections based on facts. I think that that is under attack and I mean, it's a little wobbly right now, but on the other hand, I think it's more robust um, you know, it proved to be more robust in 2020 than some people were worried that it would be. So, sorry for hijacking your question, but I think we might be actually be closer to it without actually having it. No, I actually, I think that's a really, that's a really interesting observation. In fact, you can make the, the case that, um, that in some ways, um, the fact that our election authorities in most places are technically independent of the judiciary, but were in essence backstopped by the judiciary suggests that we do still have a nonpartisan or as you say, fact-based um, foundation for election administration uh, in this country. Um, Want to toss it out to the rest of the panel? Anybody else have thoughts? I've got lots of questions, so. Um, yeah, uh, I repeat the model. I believe in state electoral management boards, uh, integrated by independent members appointed by the legislator, uniform electoral rules and procedures to the uh, county managers appointed by the electoral vote, and first, uh, very important, accountability of the work of the electoral votes, uh, of the electoral board. Uh, criminal prosecution for misconduct, very clear that is a very, um, a high responsibility uh, needs a very uh, high standard of integrity and that any misconduct will be criminally prosecuted. Must not be uh, a possibility of the, of the district attorney, of the state attorney to prosecute or not. Electoral uh, misconduct must be a, a criminal prosecutor and, and have a criminal liability. And I think that a national mechanism of coordination between all states in central issues like voting technology. And uh, uh, I, I know that the voter registration database is a state-based, but must be a link, an interoperability and a link between them in order to unsubscribe people that goes out of, from a state and, uh, and communicate to the state where now reside that you have an, uh, uh, one more eligible voter in your state. I think that the courts must inform that mechanism of coordination about felons, about convictions, about any uh, decision that may impact on the voter eligibility. I know that it's very complex in a, a federation, in, in, a, in the framework of the United States Constitution, but it's possible. And if it is possible, you can try to push forward. Terrific. So let me ask another question. I'm going to start. Um, we've talked a lot about this notion of nonpartisanship as if we know exactly what that is. Um, but um, the 2005 report, um, I'm going to make sure I'm reading this right, 
noted that election administrators should be neutral, professional, and impartial. Um, and I'm going to ask a question that I know is near and dear to Charles's heart, but I'd like to hear what other folks have um, to say about that. How might we measure this notion of neutrality, professionalism, and impartiality? Um, and who should set those standards? Doug mentioned being all, so I'll start, but only to give my, my colleagues a chance to think about the answer. I mean, you, you, you mentioned the possibility of, of measuring, and so you've, you've, um, you've roped me in. The one I'll focus on is professionalism. And I mean, that's one actually that, um, so measurement, well, let me talk about professionalism and then maybe some, some measurements. Um, I think one of the consequences of the Baker Commission and several commissions like it and um, several organizations like the Pew Center, Center on the States, another, another Pew organization, um, have helped move election administration toward a more professionalized path. Um, you know, 20 years ago, you know, we, we talk a lot about how you know, election administrators are giving out dog licenses and all sorts of other things, and they kind of pick it up on the side. But that's less often, I mean, it's less, less often true. You more likely have technocratic people who have backgrounds in other, other fields. I'm a big fan of um, Secretary Adams' election director who has a very strong kind of engineering background, process-oriented background, thinks about things in a systematic way. And so although it's not a profession in the sense that law or accountancy are, it's still profession in the sense, increasingly a profession in which there are standard operation operating procedures. There are standards like Alejandro talks about coordinating between the states in terms of what's the right best practice, regardless of where you are, those sorts of things. That is growing in America. And um, I think we need more of it. And so in terms of metrics, well, I don't know, more people getting certificates from, say, a certain program in Minnesota would be um, one measure, um, um, or in Auburn, other places, right? I mean, there are professional um, um, certificates that people can get. And um, so, so drawing people from the professions that manage big operations um, and education in the area, having more people educated in this area, I think would be one, one metric. And my guess is if we could measure 2005 versus 2021, we would see big, um, big increases on that dimension. I want to jump in if I can. Uh, this uh, this uh, recommendation from the report, I think, is directly tied to another recommendation that we're not talking about uh, yet, at least, which is that the states should centralize this. Uh, even if a state can find neutral qualified experts to run things at the state level. Uh, unless you centralize election administration at the state level, then you've also got to have county officials who are capable of this. Here in Kentucky, uh, we have 120 counties and they all elect their county clerks and the county clerks by law are the chief election officials of their counties. Uh, most of these folks, if they have a degree at all, it's a high school degree. They're not, they're not trained in election administration in any uh, formal way. They're, they're local politicians. They were the high school quarterback or, or whatever in their communities, and that's how they got elected. And so uh, we can't take this without going to the next step and doing the rest of it. Uh, but let me let me offer maybe a dissenting view uh, from, from the report's uh, recommendation. I think having accountability at the ballot box of people like me outweighs us being appointed uh, nonpartisan experts, as, as it were. Uh, and here's a couple of reasons. One of them is... I don't accept the premise that you are going to have partisanship in this office if you have a partisan person elected to hold the office. Uh, I challenge you to find a secretary of state of either party uh, in my state or anywhere uh, who has been overtly political in the job, uh, who hasn't aspired to be apolitical and fair, almost judicial in this in this role. Uh, I can't think of a lot of examples of, of bad actors in that sense. And almost all of us are elected at the ballot box uh, by party. So. A point that was made earlier by others is we actually largely already have nonpartisan administration uh, in a lot of ways. But number one, I think these people have got to be accountable to the voters. And here's another point. I think you do better in this job if you have the political skills 
that come from running for office. Uh, the biggest responsibility that I had in 2020 and, and this year in trying to get a bill passed was communicating with the public, uh, communicating with the media, with legislators, with everybody, and selling, selling these ideas, selling expanded access, selling the program, knowing the technology certainly, but also being someone who was capable of, of communication on a broad scale. And I had to rely on my political skills that I honed as a candidate for office. I just don't know that you would have that same uh, impetus coming from nonpartisan experts, if they'd be as influential in getting uh, positive change abroad or, or not, or as effective in, in calming the public's fears. Uh, I think it kind of helped that I was a Republican when most of the people who were dubious of the changes in our state, at least, were Republicans. I felt like I had a little bit more street cred when I called out false allegations of of a susceptibility to fraud in our election system with the changes that we made. So obviously there's great arguments on both sides, but put me down as in favor of, of keeping that part of our system. And I will note that the research does suggest that voters feel the same way in many ways. They do like the ability to elect their election officials um, precisely for the accountability that um, you suggest. So I, I often talk about nonpartisanship being not in how you get the job, but how you do the job. And so thinking about how to measure folks against that kind of standard is, is incredibly important. Alejandro? If you allow me, I don't want that uh, my remarks on independence of the members of the electoral management body uh, is taken as a demonization of the partisan uh, appointed uh, officers, officials. I think that the Secretary of State uh, will not um, uh, will not um, uh, go out of the responsibilities of the institutional responsibilities of the elections, but I believe that the management, the management and the organization of the elections, try, must be uh, um, conducted by independent members with a professional staff, um, but the responsibility of putting uh, forward a bill, electoral laws, the reform in it itself is a responsibility of the, Secretary, of the Secretary of State because it's a political question. Electoral, electoral issues are political questions in the best of the concepts of political questions, but electoral management must be a professional uh, work. That, I, I want to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Charles? I was just about, I mean, I was going to add on to that. With, with, all due respect, do, with all due respect to the Secretary of State we have on the panel, I think it's fair to say, and he would, he would say so as well, is that, you know, in every state, there is a professional director of elections. And in almost every state, that professional director of elections survives um, turnover in party control, certainly in you know, whoever the, the top person in office is. And I think actually this is a really important point that is missed on the public, a lot of activists, a lot of journalists, that um, by, and, and so in some way, I mean, there's a really important, I agree entirely, there's a really important political role to be played by the Secretary of State as basically the political leader giving gravitas and legitimacy to you know what was happening in the state um, but there's also a lot more kind of neutral best management best practices professionalism going on in most states than I think most voters know and most of the public know and that's something I wish we could emphasize um, and um, yeah I mean I, that, that's a story that just hasn't been told enough and I think um, goes a long way toward um, helping to achieve kind of a politics neutral administration of elections. So that's actually, a, that's a nice lead into the last of my questions. Um, uh, one constant theme that we've had throughout all of the panels is um, this notion of policymakers driving reform these days rather than um, folks in the election community. I'm curious what um, any or all of you think about the notion that while we do see reforms moving through political bodies like legislatures, 
to what extent should those reforms be at least run by and consulted with election officials, if not actually driven by uh, election officials? Um, and I'm not just talking about uh, meta issues of election administration, but just any um, issue um, in the election sphere. Um, is there and should there be a role for election officials in um, helping to shape the rules under which they operate? Well, as an election official, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> uh, but, you know, in our state, we got the county clerks at the table. We got uh, uh, the election directors, me, obviously, at, at the table. And, and we wrote this in, in, uh, starting with them. And then obviously, of course, we added uh, legislators and others and, and heard from interest groups and so forth. But we began with a product that was drafted by election officials. The, the very beginning of this was me surveying all 120 of our county clerks. What do you wanna see in this bill? And that was the, the uh, big picture stuff like early voting and so forth, but it was also the little technical suggestions they had. So I think the election officials absolutely be, have to be right at the table at the very beginning. Uh, you'll get a better product that way. And it'll also be seen as less political by either side if it's been written by the experts instead of politicians on one side or the other. It makes a big difference. And let me let me add a little unfortunate note. Uh, I won't name names for obvious reasons, but I can tell you that we, we should not assume that state legislators have any more uh, understanding of the election system than the average constituent. Uh, I, I have a lot of legislators who believe a lot of conspiracy theories. They saw stuff on Facebook. They saw a meme. They, they saw a rumor. And, and they believe it just like any other constituent would. And these are our policymakers. Uh, so we've got some, of course, that this is true in every state, some are absolutely outstanding and some, some are literally representative of their constituents' views. And so certainly you gotta have your legislators at the table, but we should always start with the election officials. Well, I'm just, I'm gonna take off my neutral hat and say that's another reason that makes Kentucky somewhat unusual um, in recent, um, events and if we could if we could see more election officials being um, if not if in the driver's seat at least somewhere in the vehicle as it moves forward that would be fantastic anyone else well um i mean i think it's tricky i mean i, I agree entirely i mean I, I think um election officials are on the whole un undervalued in these discussions um and particularly the more politicized things um the more they may get shut out um, um, and we've seen this, I think, in Florida, for instance, where election officials um, almost unanimously push back with limited success against what was happening there. Um, Georgia actually is kind of interesting. There were some kind of good government things that got into the Georgia um, bill because of election official involvement. Um, it's tricky in the sense that, um, you know, um, there's one election official for every, you know, kind of um, local jurisdiction in America, depending a, a county or a municipality. And um, so, you know, the, the kind of the median election official um, is overseeing a really small jurisdiction with very few voters. Um, and so there are dynamics in many states where in normal times, election law to the degree that it does rely on election officials is aimed at pleasing small to medium sized jurisdictions and doesn't always um, go to where the voters are. And I think that's the trick in state and national efforts for reform is to balance, you know, the disparate, you know, everything from, you know, in, in Massachusetts from Cuddyhunk Island, Gosnold, with 23 voters to the city of Boston with hundreds of thousands of voters and you know Texas which has you know the largest and even larger disparity between Harris County um, and Loving County and so um, and you know so we have to balance that and so I, I yes absolutely um, they need to be in the car and under certain circumstances they need to be driving the car and in other, um, other circumstances, you know, other forces need to say, well, we're not there yet, right? I mean, so it, it really depends then on the specific issue you're talking about. 
um, about how much deference um, to election officials. But, but certainly there needs to be more um, most of the time. It is certainly true that if you're not on the, um, what is it, if you're not on the agenda, you're on the menu. Um, and I think election officials have found themselves on the menu um, far too often lately. Well, let me go. I have a really good question um, from the audience, and um, it's it's for Alejandro. But I'm actually curious what everybody thinks. Let's start with him. Um, is there a reason that elections should be managed by a multi-member board in the way that you describe, rather than just an individual appointed in the same way? Independence independence doesn't grant knowledge and experience in these matters. So by a, a question of um, responsibility or, or accountability of the work of the of the election electoral organization i believe in uh, in in multi and in, in boards not in in individual appointments i was chief electoral officer of a, a national level in argentina i managed the elections in the whole country with millions and millions of voters and uh, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of ballot boxes. But I don't think that's a, a good experience. It's many, many it's, a, it's a very, very big responsibility in the shoulders of one person that may, may apply correctly the law, but may have the, his own interpretations. So have a, a, a context of discussion and uh, a way of, of um, um, collective decision must be uh, um, may grant a better outcome. And uh, just to follow up on that, um, in many states, as, as Charles and others have noted, there is a staff of people who persist from uh, administration to administration. Um, might that staff in the absence of the ability to appoint multiple members of a board, at least be a source of that kind of expertise. I guess I'm just thinking, um, you know, living here in the DC area, um, how often you see vacancies on boards, um, which result in um, gridlock or inability to act. I'm wondering if having a single person supported by a staff could at least be an approximation, if not inequality with the, the, the kind of structure you imagine? Maybe a, a, a temporary, maybe a temporary solution. Uh, I served under five presidents. My, my position was appointed by the president and I served under five presidencies. Uh, it was an extraordinary uh, issue. I was a, a, polit a politician first, and then I became an electoral administration, a neutral electoral administrator. So uh, maybe there are people in the staff that may uh, warranty neutrality, professionalism, etc. But that is a temporary, in my point, of, from my point of view, a temporary solution because uh, political parties and the legislature must arrive to an agreement, a bipartisan agreement to select and appoint the correct people in this mechanism of management. Also, the Secretary of State, that at the end of the day is the final responsible of the electoral issues in the state, also may appoint a kind of intervention temporarily. Well, actually, thank you for bringing up the, the, the issue of Secretary of State. Um, I had a question from the audience. Um, this is kind of a rip from the headlines, uh, law and order style. Um, we've seen um, um, reports recently of Secretaries of State announcing their candidacies for other offices um, in elections where at least technically they would be overseeing their own election. Um, how should that be handled? How is it handled around the world? And um, what might voters think about that? And I'm going to put speed round rules on everybody because we're coming up at the end of our time together. Well, I can tell you how it was handled in Kentucky. Uh, my two immediate predecessors both ran for the U.S. Senate while they were Secretary of State, and they presided over their own defeats. <laughs> and uh, neither one uh, was successful. And, and no one, uh, no one seriously contended that. 
they were trying to get any sort of uh, inappropriate advantage from the fact that they were the chief election officials. I mean, even if you're not running for a higher office, if you're running for re-election, if this is an office where you can retain the incumbent, then you're going to have a situation where, for example, I can preside over my own uh, re-election. I don't see that as any different. Uh, so I, if you're going to have people uh, able to run for an office, then you're always going to have this issue. Uh, I think Virginia is the only state now where uh, they have one term and you're out. Uh, and it used to be even their attorney general, uh, if he ran for governor, he'd have to resign as attorney general uh, to run because of conflicts. But that's highly unusual. And you've not really seen uh, corruption in the election system around the country and the states like Kentucky that allow the secretary of state to be a candidate for this office or another one. I'm duty bound to report that, can, that uh, Virginia is unique and wonderful in many ways. And that's just one of them. Um, anybody else on the panel? I, I would just remark that it, is, it does seem to me unusual. If you take my my argument earlier, that one of the that one of the strengths that was revealed um, in this last election was kind of the fact based judicial quasi judicial um, um, nature of our election system. That there's not either some requirement or norm of recusal at least when decisions affect people running, which actually is different from resign to run, right? Um, and um, um, I mean, and that actually might be a, a reasonable middle ground um, from re requiring secretaries of state to step down um, and would m argue in favor of having some um, legal authority in all states that was multi-headed um, to deal with um, disputes that arise rather than having them land on a single person. So there could be different ways of dealing with this issue without a resign to run requirement. I'll, I'll just add, I think there, are, again, um, there's the sort of question about policy-wise, what's the right thing to do? And then there's the question of how this affects how the public views elections and election in integ integrity. And so um, I think it's very possible to oversee one's own election, but, but I also think it's really particularly incumbent on, on people to keep in mind how that colors the way voters might feel about um, the integrity of the process. Well, very good. Well, I would really one more time want to thank uh, the panel uh, today for um, their remarks and for their incredibly thoughtful answers um, to um, my seemingly interminable um, questions. Um, uh, but you all have, um, it's really been um, a pleasure having all of you. We really appreciate you taking the time um, to share um, with me and the audience today. Um, with that, um, I will thank our panelists and I will turn things over to um, David Carroll of the Carter Center to play us out. David? Thank you, Doug. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to everybody in the audience for, for watching and also to our excellent panelists for yet another great discussion in this series. It's been great. Uh, before closing, I'd just like to say a few quick words of thanks uh, to everybody at the Baker Institute and the Rice, Univers and Rice University for this really excellent collaboration, John Williams and Mark Jones in particular and colleagues at the Carter Center who have done a lot of the heavy lifting to put this all together. Uh, most importantly, Avery Davis Roberts and Soya Ellison. Uh, to our audience, if you missed any of the previous sessions, we'd like to point out that you can see video recordings at uh, either the Carter Center or the Baker Institute YouTube channel. So we hope you'll have a chance to check in on those. And lastly, looking forward, um, the Carter Center and the Baker Institute uh, hope to, we, we will produce a final report on this series and the main takeaways that, uh, that we can identify. And we're hoping that we'll, there'll be other opportunities for us to work together and maybe to bring in some of the past panelists, hopefully all the past panelists in some way or another. We really appreciate uh, all your sharing your insights. It's been really helpful to, to all of us as we think about the state of democracy here in our country. Uh, so please look at both of our websites going forward. We'll, we'll make information available about our future plans. And then uh, in the meantime, you know, stay healthy, get your vaccinations if you haven't already, and follow official public health guidelines. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate it. Bye-bye.